Hi, welcome back. It is 2018, and if it's 2018 and it's a new week, it must be a new crisis. And this week's crisis is, of course, Turkey. Now, I do think that globalization has brought with it the perils of being connected at the head. Everybody's problem is everybody else's problem, which effectively means that if Turkey has a problem, then India and Brazil have a problem, and so does the U.S., as a consequence, we are going to see more crises going forward, just as we have for the last few years. That said, though, some of these crises are worsened and exaggerated by bad corporate behavior. And that is what I'd like to talk about in the context of Turkey, not so much to pick on Turkish companies, but to make more general points about how dangerous it is when companies ignore corporate finance first principles. So let's start by looking at the Turkish crisis. The most obvious symbol of this crisis is, of course, what's happened to the Turkish lira. The Turkish lira has lost about 80% of its value over the last five years and about 25% of its value just in the first two weeks of August. Now, when you look at a currency collapsing, usually that's a symptom of a deeper problem. In the case of Turkey, that deeper problem is inflation. Inflation in Turkey is out of control. The measures of inflation we can debate about, but the reality is inflation is in the double digits, perhaps 12%, maybe 15 maybe even 20%. Now, the obvious fix, or at least a pushback against inflation, is for central banks to raise rates to try to bring inflation down. In the case of Turkey, there's a political problem on top of a banking problem. The leadership in Turkey seems to believe that lowering interest rates is in fact the best fix for higher inflation. So in a sense, they've handicapped their own central bank in the fight against inflation. The bottom line is Turkey has a political problem, an economic problem, and a banking problem that right now is playing out as a collapse in its currency and a rise in inflation. Now, before we look at what's happened to Turkish companies as a consequence, let's think about what the consequences are across the board. The immediate effect, of course, is within Turkey, the economy is slowed, the bankers have panicked, and foreign exchange reserves are running low. But the problem is spreading. There is a cont contagion problem, and you're seeing this play out. First, in emerging market currencies dropping across the board. What's happened in Turkey seems to be affecting the Indian rupee, the Brazilian rupee, the Indonesian rupee. Second, you're seeing default spreads increasing in markets, both sovereign default spreads and corporate default spreads. So clearly, people are much more worried about default across the board. And equity markets are coming under pressure. They're holding up remarkably well so far, but they are coming under pressure. So let's, before we look at what the Turkish problem is and why it's made worse by how Turkish companies behave, let's go back to corporate finance first principles. In my corporate finance class, I'm, I, I, I sent to the class around what I call the three basic corporate finance principles. The first is the investment principle. Effectively, it says when you go out and make investments in projects or assets, make sure you earn a return that exceeds your minimum acceptable hurdle rate. That's first principle. The second principle is the financing principle. It says when you go out and borrow money, try to find the mix of debt and equity that minimizes your hurdle rate. And also, make sure you match the debt up to your assets. And finally, there's the dividend principle that says if you cannot find investments that earn your return, give the cash back to the stockholders. Whether you do it in dividends or stock buybacks depends on what kind of stockholders you have. Now, we spend a lot of time on the investment principle, maybe even a lot of time on the dividend principle and on the financing principle. When we talk about it in class or in practice, we focus on the mix question. What is the right mix of debt and equity? I'm not underplaying the importance of that question, but the second half, of the financing principle is just as important. You need to match your debt up to your assets. What am I talking about? When you think about what the right kind of debt for your company is, it should reflect the kind of assets you have. If your projects slash assets are long term, you're like Boeing, your typical project runs 25 to 30 years, your debt should be long term. If your typical project is a short term project, a two or a three year project, the right kind of debt for you is short term. Second, if you look at the cash flow profile on a typical project, are your cash flows even over time? Even not in the sense they're exactly the same number, but they're about the same number. A hundred million every year for the next 20 years. Are there cash flows which are low up front and grow over time? You're saying, why do you care? If it is the former, your debt is your cash flows are even, you're a much better candidate for straight debt. Whereas if your cash flows are low right now and you want to keep your cash flow payments on debt low, you want to issue convertible debt, 
because that'll keep the coupon rate low now and convert back into equity as your cash flows grow. Third, tell me what currency your cash flows are in. If you show me the pie chart of the currencies in which you get your cash flows, I want to design debt that has roughly the same currency mix. So if 70% of your cash flows are in US dollars and 30% are in euros, I'd like to see debt that reflects that mix. And finally, how much pricing power do you have? Why does that matter? Well, if you have pricing power and there's inflation, you can feed it through in prices to your customers and your cash flows should grow with inflation. If that is the case, you're a much better candidate for floating rate debt. If that is not the case, you should be issuing fixed rate debt. That's 90% of debt design. How long terms, straight or convertible, what currency, fixed rate or floating rate. So the basic principle in debt is to match your debt up to your assets. And there are two ways you can accomplish this. One is in debt design. You can design debt that matches up your assets. And for many companies, that is done at the time of issuance. But the other way in which you can match up debt is by using derivatives markets and swap markets. Give me an example. Let's assume that your cash flows are all in Indian rupees. You decide to borrow in dollars. You can use futures markets or forward markets to get rid of the mismatch. You think, which one should I do? Should I go with the debt design or derivatives? I have a very simple rule. If you know your long-term exposure upfront, if you have your asset composition and you know it's pretty stable, then you should be designing debt to match those assets. But if your asset composition is unstable, you don't know where your projects are going to come from or what currency your cash flows will be in, you're a much better candidate to use derivatives and swaps. Now, before we move on, let's talk about why matching debt up increases your value as a firm. If you have mismatched debt, using short-term debt to fund your long-term assets, dollar debt to fund your lira assets, you're exposing yourself to more default risk. Why? Because if you mismatch, you've increased your chances of not being able to make those debt payments. If the dollar moves in the wrong direction, you're in trouble. That pushes up your cost of debt and your cost of capital. By matching your debt up to your assets, you reduce your default risk, and in your valuation, that reduces your cost of debt, lowers your cost of capital, increases your value as a firm. It's Corporate Finance 101. That should be common sense, right? You'd think that most companies would follow this rule. But companies around the world seem to revel in mismatching debt to assets, using short-term debt to fund long-term assets, debt in one currency to fund assets in another currency. And Turkish companies are among the worst in the world when it comes to mismatching currencies. They seem to want to borrow money in dollars and euros and fund projects in lira. So let's think about how deep this problem is. And rather than use data from outside and be accused of using bias data, I'm going to use data from the Turkish Central Bank to illustrate the extent of the Turkish corporate problem. So I'm going to focus on non-financial service companies, essentially companies we can't say that these are banks and this is their job. These are non-financial service companies in Turkey. And the first number I want to point to is the foreign exchange imbalance. The Turkish Central Bank keeps track of, Turk, of, of foreign exchange assets owned by non-financial companies and foreign exchange libraries. And that imbalance is growing. In fact, by the time you get to 2018, in May of 2018, Turkish companies had, took, had foreign exchange libraries that exceeded their assets by $217 billion. That was three times higher than what it was in 2008. But you can see it's a problem that's been building over time. Now you'd say, well, that's because foreign banks are probably lending to these companies and these poor companies have no choice but to borrow money. Well, it turns out that much of the borrowing that Turkish companies are doing in foreign exchange comes from Turkish banks. Turkish banks in 2018 accounted for 59% of Turkish foreign exchange liabilities. In other words, when Turkish companies are borrowing foreign exchange, Turkish banks and financial service companies are the ones supplying them with that foreign exchange. And if you add to it the fact that there's a maturity mismatch, a maturity mismatch in what sense? If you look at the percentage of foreign exchange assets owned by Turkish non-financial companies, that number has been about 80% or slightly higher for much of the last decade. The debt has been short term when you start off, only about 40% of the debt is short term. And that's become a lower and lower number as you've gone through time. And by the time you get to 2018, less than 30% of the debt is short term, funding about 80% about of your assets that are short term. So you have a currency mismatch and a maturity mismatch. And there is pain coming in the, in the near term. And let me explain this. 
As I said, 59% of the debt the Turkish companies are taking are coming from Turkish banks. The rest are coming from non-Turkish banks, German banks, French banks, US banks. It is conceivable that in the near term, the Turkish government can put pressure on Turkish banks to ease up, to not force repayments. But a significant chunk of the debt is still due to outside banks. And in this table, I've looked at how much of the debt is coming due by year. And here's the bad news. 40 to 50% of the debt for all Turkish companies is coming due in the next three years. So the lira continues to stay low. This pain cannot be avoided. It is coming in the near term. Now, if you look at the mismatch and you say, why is it happening? And it's, as I said, Turkish companies are among the worst culprits, but it's around the world. It's clearly a problem. Turkish companies have a mismatch problem. I don't think you can avoid it. And the worst thing is this has happened before. This mismatch has happened before. You've gone through crises and in a crisis, Turkish companies get close to defaulting. Turkish banks go into a tailspin. Turkish governments have to step in and bail them out. This has happened before. And if the definition of insanity is you keep doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different outcome, this is insane. And it's not just in Turkey. This happens around the world and it's happening increasingly as Indian companies and Malaysian companies and Indonesian companies have access to global markets. You're seeing increasing percentages of companies around the world, perhaps not to the extent that you see in Turkey, mismatching their debt and their assets when it comes to currency. So I've listened to CFOs around the world try to explain why they mismatch currencies. And I've classified these reasons into acceptable reasons dangerous reasons and bad reasons. Let's start with three potentially acceptable reasons for why you might, might want to mismatch debt. If you have mismatched debt that's being offered to you at a subsidized rate, what does that mean? That somebody's lending money to you at way below what they should be charging you. Why would they do that? Either because they're being myopic and caught up in the, mo the mood of the moment or because they have a different objective. The IFC, for instance, which is no, which lends money to corporations around the world, sometimes lends at below market rates because part of its mission is to encourage development in emerging markets. If you're offered mismatched debt at rates below what you should be paying, you should take it because that is to your advantage. In some cases, companies use debt outside their markets because domestic debt markets are moribund. They've gone to sleep. This is especially the case in emerging markets where banks are the only place you can go to borrow money. And sometimes banks freeze up. They refuse to lend money or they refuse to lend money long term. So if you're a company that needs long term debt, you might have to go outside your markets. And if you do so, you might have no choice but to borrow in a foreign currency. And the third is, if you remember in debt design, your objective is to design debt that behaves and acts like equity, to have a lot of flexibility built in, conversion options, floating rates, perhaps even connect, you know, connecting the interest rate to commodity prices. Now that that's, might not be doable when you're borrowing from a bank. Banks are rigid in the way they lend money. Corporate bond markets are more flexible and perhaps if you need more flexible debt, you might have to access corporate bond markets outside and that might lead to a mismatch of the debt. Now having said all of this, if this is the reason you've mismatched your debt, you're getting it at a, <laughs> at a subsidized rate, you have to borrow money outside your country because banks are not lending money or you want more flexible, more structured debt, debt that is more customized to you, I think you should follow up and then try to fix the problem, at least reduce your mismatch problem using the derivatives markets. So if you have an acceptable reason for mismatching debt upfront, you should still find a way to reduce that mismatch. There are a couple of dangerous reasons for mismatching debt. Let's face it, if you mismatch debt, sometimes it works in your favor and yours out. Let's assume you borrow money in Lira, I'm sorry, borrow money in US dollars to fund Lira projects. The inflation rate in Lira is much higher than the inflation rate in US dollars. So the interest rate on dollar debt will be much lower than the interest rate in Lira debt. Let's assume that notwithstanding the higher inflation, the lira strengthens against the dollar instead of weakening. With higher inflation, it should weaken. But let's say it strengthens. If it strengthens, you get a double whammy. Not only have you borrowed money at a lower rate than you could have, but the currency movement works in your favor. You report higher profits. There are emerging markets where currencies work, move against purchasing power parity, you know, where inflation is supposed to drive exchange rates for extended periods. And you can go years reporting higher profits because you mismatched your debt. So for some companies, this becomes a way of speculating on currency. So you're saying, what's wrong with that? Well, let's face it. Even those who claim that their expertise is forecasting currencies are not very good at it. 
currency forecasting makes um, you know, uh, I don't know, soothsaying look good. M most people who play, try to forecast currencies don't do well. And the last thing I want you to do as a company, whether you're a manufacturing company or a mining company, is spending your time forecasting currency. So dangerous reason for mismatching debt is currency speculation. A second reason is everybody else does it. And in fact, there's a hidden rationale here. If every company in a country mismatch, uh, mismatches debt, your argument is, this is a problem that's too big to go away. So what the government has to do is step in and bail all of us up. Nice rationale, but it works only if the government has enough money to bail you up. If the problem is so big that you cannot be bailed up, this is going to blow up in your face. And finally, even if it's bailed out, remember it's taxpayer money, it's not free. Finally, come the bad reasons. One really bad reason for borrowing money in a foreign currency is the interest rate is lower. Let's face it. If you're in Turkey, borrowing money in US dollars or euros will always come with a lower interest rate on the face of the loan than borrowing money in lira. That's neither here nor there. You cannot compare interest rates in debt in different currencies because you have different inflation rates. Is borrowing money at 5% cheaper than borrowing money at 9%? You're saying, obviously. Well, let me rephrase the question. Is borrowing money at 5% in US dollar terms cheaper than borrowing money at 9% in rupee terms? Much tougher question to answer because you have different inflation rates. So, but lots of CFOs seem to fall into the trap of borrowing money in foreign currencies because the rate looks lower. Another bad reason, comes from a perverse reading of risk-reward relationships. We know the lessons in finance. To make higher returns, you need to take more risk. So some companies argue, what's wrong with mismatching currencies? I increase the risk, but because I increase the risk, I should get higher reward. This suggests that you get rewarded for all risk you take, when in fact, markets are much more discriminating. They have no reason to reward you for risk you should not be exposed to, that you are exposing yourself to by being stupid. So mismatching debt because you borrow money at a low rate or because you think it's going to give you higher returns in the long term, I think are terrible reasons for mismatching debt. So this is, as I said, a problem that is particularly bad in Turkey, but is spreading around the world. How do we fix this problem? Because this problem is going to make crises worse. It's going to magnify the effects of currency problems. I think everybody has to pull their weight. First, governments have to stop bailing out companies even if it makes a crisis worse, because every time you bail out companies with mismatch debt, you're teaching them the wrong lesson. Second, bank regulators, when they look at banks, should measure the, measure the health of the banks using the conventional measures of, hey, do you have enough capital to cover your loans, but also how many of those loans are mismatched, and punish banks that are more mismatched loans by making them carry more regulatory capital. In effect, you're making loans that are mismatched you should be less profitable by making, and, and one way I can do that is by making you set aside more capital. Banks, when they lend money, should use good sense. If you're a borrower and you are mismatching your debt to your assets, banks should charge you a higher interest rate to cover the default risk. If you're a business, it is in your best interest not to mismatch debt. So don't fall for the facile reasons. The debt looks cheaper. If you've mismatched debt, remember you're affecting your value in the long term, even though you might have short term profits. And finally, investors need to be much more discriminating when it comes to company profitability. A company that is profitable because it is mismatched debt should be treated very differently from a company that is profitable because it's taken great investments. We need to take out that foreign exchange gain out of profits before we measure profitability, because otherwise we're rewarding companies for doing the wrong thing. Am I hopeful that all these changes will happen in the near term? Not really, but I think we need to start working on this. We violate corporate finance principles at our own risk, our own risk as in co our collective risk. And I think in Turkey, we're fe seeing the consequences of that mismatch. It might be too late, to do anything about the Turkish problem in this crisis, but at least we can keep the, the next crisis, we can reduce the impact of that crisis by trying to deal with the mismatch. I hope you found the session useful and thank you very much for listening.